worse than ending late on a Friday, right? <laughs> we got to stay on time. The worst was you know, we've done this in the past. We went till 4.30 on Friday. 4.30 on Friday. Yeah, that's yeah, not happening. Drive home. Yeah, yeah. Okay. All right. Well, good morning. Um, I hope you all had a nice evening and you read the book entirely, right? From yeah. front to back. Okay. Just <laughs> Memorize. All right. So for the next hour and a half, we're just going to pick up where we left off yesterday, and we're going to go rather quickly because that's what you do on a Friday morning. Um, and good morning to everybody virtually that is also joining. All right. The first thing I like to focus on, and I do this with clients, is I say we're going to focus on three areas, time, access, and money. Um, and so when you're even thinking about treatment planning, this is a great way of thinking about this. What are the goals in helping people with time when they're no longer gambling or they're reducing their gambling? What are the goals in terms of access to gambling? And what are the goals in terms of the finances? All right, so for those who get to do treatment plans, this is a great way to kind of make this very succinct. And it's not the same treatment plan for every client, but yet it feels like it is because you are addressing the same types of uh, issues over and over again. So what I'm sharing is very um, activity and task focused, not to take away from all of the processing that we do as clinicians, but just to give you that um, second order change, that different perspective on the same things and think about this as we continue to work with younger generations and all of the technology. Uh, so there's a lot that goes on in this chapter, the harm reduction approaches across the continuum. I know that uh, many people, uh, maybe even uh, virtually, were at the Indiana conference. I did a whole thing on self-exclusion as a clinical intervention, so I'm not going to spend as much time today, but please ask questions um, if you have any. So how do we help people with time? Right? When we get them to start thinking about how much time they are spending gambling, right? that can be a significant amount of time per day. <clears throat> and you want to find out at what time of the day do they spend the most time. This, wouldn't be a, this would be this very similar when we think about uh, gaming. Right? And younger generation, younger kids, we know different times of the day they spend a lot more time gaming than other times. So you, you're, you're looking to find where they spend the most time and then you're helping them problem solve how to spend their time differently. So what are some things that you do right now to help people figure out time? Please, yeah. Uh, using uh, kind of a journal, like journaling. Uh, journaling? Okay. And then how you're feeling after and how much time you spent. Okay. So doing the CBT uh, techniques, journaling, mm -hmm. and really staying present, right, um, with what's going on. What do you, how would we translate that in the tech world? What would we do? Hours logged in. Hours logged in? Mm -hmm. Like something, keep, it, keep track of it electronic? If it's online or just a console. Okay. Perfect. So looking at uh, any time, any type of a timer, any log that says how long you've been doing. So get that awareness of how much time is spent to then figure out how do I spend my time differently, right? Call it what it is with clients. Boredom, right? And I say to some clients, you will be solving this for the rest of your life, right? We got to get better at it. Uh, some individuals really don't need a lot of sleep. I'm not one of those individuals. I love my sleep, right? But there are some people that can function very well on five hours. There's, they got to solve for boredom even more, right? And really talking through that. But when you're able to really call it, then people are starting to see that when they're bored, they gamble. When they're bored, they game, right? When they're bored, they're doing a lot more online. And we're saying, okay. Feed the mind, feed the soul. We got to do something different here. How do we want to solve for this? Okay, podcasts. How many of you listen to podcasts? 
right? The younger generation is much more likely to go to a podcast. Why? Instant, on demand, convenient for them. I am so excited that there are six different gambling recovery podcasts. Could we say that three years ago? Nope, right? So these are a couple. Um, all in the Addicted Gamblers podcast is probably the one that has the most episodes. So how do you give podcasts as homework? What are some of the things you would say? You could suggest a specific episode if it's uh, okay. very into what you're talking about that day. Suggest a specific episode means that you have to have listened to those podcasts, mm -hmm. right? And so rule number one, don't recommend tech if you haven't played with it yourself you'll look like you don't know what you're talking about. Because <laughs> you won't, right? <laughs> so you, you, you gotta get curious with these. Um, and I'll explain more about All In Addicted Gamblers podcast. The newest one that uh, came out was the Broke Girl Society. What audience do you think that podcast caters to? Women. <laughs> Trick question, right? Okay, this, so it's, it's women in recovery talking about their recovery, about their gambling, about their real issues. And it's so helpful to recommend this to women, women of all ages, right? Now, if you're going to recommend to someone who says, I've never listened to a podcast before, then you get them to take their phone out in front of you and you get them to find the podcast and subscribe to it and hit play to make sure that they know how to do that. Don't tell them what to do. Get them to do it in session, right? And so I found it helpful to recommend a, um, either an episode or the actual podcast. And I say, I want you to listen to two podcasts before our next session and tell me what you liked about it, what, what, resonated with you, what you, what you couldn't connect with, give them permission to say they didn't like something, but they at least listen to it. Okay? Ronson. I think, uh, and I have not heard of this one before, and you will certainly check it out, because in treating a lot of women, and as I told you last night, my women have been older women. Yep. Referring them to GA, which GA in our area is primarily older men, is not always the best alternative for them. Right, and we're going to talk about GA. And so this would be very handy. It, it's, it's super convenient. It's hard for people to not do the homework when it's instant and on demand, okay? And so uh, I'll say, okay, do you drive to work? And they go, yeah, I go, perfect time to be listening to a podcast, all right? Uh, do you like to cook? Oh, I love to cook. Okay, so you might cook for, you know, prep stuff for 45 minutes. Perfect time to listen to a podcast. And you start to problem solve with them and say, this is how you start to feed the mind, feed the soul. Come back and tell me what you liked. Tell me what you didn't like. Um, one episode of the Broke Girl Society, I'll get it wrong, either episode six or seven, um, by a woman named Michelle M., Please listen to it yourself. Um, she is, she's got a great story. Um, later this morning, I'll reference her slides on gambling motivated crime. Okay? And she first and foremost is tenure track faculty and does research. Second is in recovery. So she doesn't start with the recovery piece. And so I always say to her, I recommended your podcast again. And she's like, ah, oh, I don't start with my recovery first, but okay, you know. And it's, but it's really, really um, a very, very helpful episode because you are going to have clients that may share something related to crime at some point. Um, and I have had men also listen to that particular episode. And they've come back, and one, one gentleman in particular said, she got knocked down and got up. She got knocked down. She got up. She got knocked down. She got up. If she can get up that many times, I can get up that many times. And it was very helpful for that particular person 
all right, listening to that. So that's a, that's a really helpful one. Um, the other one that's in the picture is uh, the After Gambling podcast, and that's from a gentleman named Jamie out of Ohio. Um, and so he kind of takes his podcast a little bit further um, into recovery, so not quite an early recovery. And then there's even more. Um, uh, All Bets Are Off is out of the UK. And the uh, Problem Gamblers podcast is out of Ireland, right? And these are very specific to gambling. Now, there's several more out there that are specific to addiction. So depending on um, what your client you know, gravitates toward, give them that homework. Go find more podcasts out there. Tell me what you found and what you liked about it, all right? Again, treatment planning, this is a really good one. But feed the mind, feed the soul. So with All In Addicted Gamblers podcast, they have several different types of episodes. So you're talking about GA. Um, younger individuals might not go to GA. GA is at a certain time of the day. You have to drive there. You don't know when it's going to end. We just have three negatives for the instant on-demand population. <laughs> okay? So, what do you, you don't say, oh, oh, and I'm sorry, do you go to a church? I'm sorry, what door do you walk in? Um, what do you say when you get there? Right? We have problem solved this with individuals before, but when you have that many issues, for someone who is much more tech on demand, they're like, yeah, I'll do that. And then every week they come back, I didn't do that. All right. So they have uh, meetings as an episode. They have recorded an online meeting. So they don't really call it GA because it's not since it's online like this. And the people in the meeting know they're being recorded and have agreed to it. And so I will say to clients, I want you to listen to one of the meetings and tell me what you think. So think about this. They do it on their time. There's no camera on. They don't have to say their name. Like you've removed several things related to being very anxious and they just get to learn what a meeting is like. This is a step towards going to a meeting, whether it's virtual or in person, is getting them to at least just listen to these, right? And this, again, this podcast has hundreds of episodes, so you have to give them, you know, help if they're not sh used to finding stuff. But the meeting one I found was super, super effective. And that's your classic MI techniques right there. Why don't you just give this a try and let me know what you think? Here's a suggestion as opposed to your treatment plan says you're going to go to one GA meeting a week because we know that doesn't work, right? So how many of you have recommended any of these podcasts before? Nobody? So this is new for you. Okay. They're very good. Um, I, I thoroughly enjoy them and the variety that they bring. Um, and several of the people that are a part of these podcasts are going to be at the uh, NCPG conference in Boston this summer because they have a whole recovery track that they're filling up, which is really nice. All right. Okay. How many of you know about all the YouTube stuff out there for recovery? Again, instant on demand. So there's a new one uh, by the same people that put uh, uh, the Broke Girl Society and All In Addicted Gamblers podcast, and they have the Bet Free Life. Please type in the Bet Free Life. <laughs> Otherwise, you will get videos about how to bet for free. And you talk about this with clients, right? Because this is how close it is to being exposed to it, right? Okay, so this is a, an example of the different episodes with Brian and Christina. And so they have quite a few that you can get that, and they're almost all an hour, okay? And so you want to do that. They were kind enough to interview me on the one that says gambling addiction and therapy. And so it was really fun to just have them ask questions. We talked about medication and the side effects of certain medications causing excessive gambling 
and it was it was just it was so um, first person and real and natural that their hope is that they reach people that are considering maybe therapy but haven't yet as as a you know to watch this because we know so many people will watch videos. Okay. I also have. Uh, have you guys ever seen Nuggets? The video Nuggets? Okay, let's watch that right now because this is a really helpful one to um, show clients in session early when they're new to this whole idea of what is gambling addiction, what, you know, what's recovery, and it's really helpful with family members. Okay, and so if you're in the um, substance use field, this is, this is all about chemical, and it, it translates very well, though, with problem gambling. So let me go ahead. What did you think? Sad. It's sad and real. Re very relatable. And so getting clients to be able to translate <coughs> from their first gambling experiences to when people will talk about how they will gamble and even when they win, they, they give it all back, right? And the chasing, you can do this with in-game betting, right? So there's lots of things that people can relate to and then family sees this and they're like, so that's what you meant when you couldn't stop, right? As opposed to it being about willpower, right? So I found that to be super, super helpful. Okay, um, and make sure you type in Nuggets Addiction when you're doing this in YouTube because otherwise you'll get the basketball nuggets, <laughs> right? All these fun little things. Uh, but that has been around since two, 2014 and has, you know, 22 million views. So it's, it's, it's an oldie but goodie when you think of, uh, think of time. Um, all right, so then um, TED Talks. Have you had clients do uh, watch any TED Talks on recovery? It's really helpful to do that. All right, have them find ones and report back to you what they found and what they liked. Um, there's a there's one that comes up in my feed uh, right here, the fall and rise of gambling addict, and this is a gentleman out of the UK and his story. And uh, it's, it's a great, and again, TED Talks are, the whole design is that you can get to the point in a short amount of time and every word matters. So again, you're addressing people's attention span with uh, most TED Talks can't be more than 18 minutes long. So it's another quick, instant, on demand, feed the mind, feed the soul. You can tell I say that all the time with my clients, right? Feed the mind, feed the soul. We have to problem solve this. Um, and then this one I stumbled upon. This gentleman, um, Jack Manfred, don't know who he is, stumbled upon it. He is blogging every day that he's not gambling. And his journey, again, extremely relatable for people. So you would uh, type in his name you'd, uh, and his newsletter, Jack's newsletter, right? Again, you have to figure this out in order to help your clients figure this out. So you get to be the student first, right? And check all of these things out. Um, but it, it's really helpful to read this. Some people, um, the night is their most difficult time. They're in bed if they're still kind of attached to their mobile device direct them on their mobile device to things that are recovery related as opposed to they go back to the things they used to listen to or watch or do, okay? Because even though you don't have sports betting legalized here, you have clients that do online sports betting on illegal sites, right? Okay, all right. All right, so I talked about the websites and blogs. So um, Brian also has a website called endgamblingharm.com, and he's the guy that did the uh, Bet Free Life as well as the All In Addicted Gamblers podcast. And um, 
He's got a very interesting story. It's a, it's a pretty young website. He's just now adding things to it. But again, it's a way for people, they hear him on the podcast, they see him on the YouTube channel, and then they have a way of emailing him. People like to feel connected, right? Give them an opportunity to email someone like Brian. So crisis line, right? Uh, I get some emails pretty late at night to my inbox from people I have no idea who they are, they're not in my state, and they'll say, it's time, I can't do this anymore, I need help, can you please help me? Now what am I going to do at 11 o'clock at night when I get an email like that? Right? What would the helpline be able to do? Right? You want to direct them to the helpline. Um, and so what I've done is I'm saying, you know, where do you live? What state? Have you called this number? Here's the council's number. In the meantime, please check out these podcasts and listen to one tonight. Like I, I leave the email with something for them to do because I know that that time of night, maybe they call a number and they don't get an immediate response, right? And so um, I had one woman, whoops, sorry about that. I had one woman that contacted me and, you know, the email that's got her whole story. And you don't want to respond with, I can't help you because I'm not licensed in your state. Bye-bye, right? And so I literally was like, check out the Broke Girl Society podcast, listen to a couple episodes, here's the New York Council's number, um, and don't give up, right? So we, you know, I, I, I do that, and I would do that with clients. If they emailed me, I would say, remember what we talked about, feed the mind, feed the soul, go listen to a podcast episode right now, You'll, you know, it'll make you feel better, hopefully, right? Anything. To, to kind of meet them where they're at. So this younger generation is, you know, I'm just gonna text you, I'm gonna email you, you've gotta be able to respond back with something that they can grab onto. All right, so you talked about the role of GA, right? Um, I hear this in a lot of my talks where I, when I travel, that GA, depending on where you are, so I'm gonna generalize um, only for the sake of illustration, that uh, GA will have a young person join the meeting and then they don't come back. Have you heard that? Uh-huh, okay, so it's no different than maybe gender differences. Um, and so uh, some of my clients are very active in GA and I kind of poke them about it and I say, what are you doing to retain the younger group? What's the inner group doing? Like, you guys gotta be active on this. Right, because we know it's that I got to drive somewhere. I don't know how long it's going to last. It's on Thursday nights. I'm pretty sure I'll, I'll forget because it's not right now. And so that is a huge task for GA to solve is how to accommodate and meet the younger generation. Make it where they want to come back or have a younger group right? Just like we have women's meetings and things like that, maybe have it named as a younger group and have someone younger with more clean time running that meeting. But this is an issue that I hear all across the country. And so there was a, um, a call out for um, solving this. And um, I think he's on the board for NCPG, Jeff Wasserman, uh, him and Brian, mostly Jeff though, started an online recovery support meeting. Notice it doesn't say GA. And Jeff was noticing that younger people would, if they came to a meeting, they wouldn't come back. He started to think about it and he has managed to create a whole bunch of online recovery, problem gambling recovery meetings and it's super filled up with young people because it's online and he, you have to get permission through Jeff. You know, he vets it so that you don't have people that aren't supposed to be there, okay? And it's very popular. It's always one hour. And he has people from all over the globe attending. 
from, and so he's got all kinds of time zones, so he, people can't say, well, that one time isn't convenient because they're smattered all over the, uh, the day and all seven days of the week, right? And so this is the one where they record for the podcast, when, for the meeting one. And so it's, it's been extremely popular with the younger generation. Now, GA also has the virtual meetings on their website, if you guys have seen those, definitely through the pandemic. Um, I've asked people to go and check out a virtual meeting. Um, DC is a big one where there's no in-person meetings, there's no virtual. Go to a different state. You can, you, know, you can do it just through the virtual meeting. Check out a different state and see what they're saying. Go to a different state that's similar to, to where you are with what's legalized in gambling and all of that. And that's also working. So you got to be creative so that we don't get the yeah buts, right? Yeah, yeah, I'll go to a meeting, but, right, here's all the different ways to, to take that in. I use Williamsburg Wellness a lot. Williamsburg Wellness, yep. They have the, um, they even have a, um, a virtual IOP program now. Mm hmm Yeah. And they've got a lot of good resources on their website. Yep. Perfect. So again, you got to know where they are. You got to figure it out yourself to then lead your clients to those same resources. Right. Now, have any of you, um, I'm trying to see what the next one is. Okay. Have any of you uh, done anything through the Facebook groups? Yeah, what, Jeremy? So uh, have you done like, there's, there's like Al-Anon? Uh, I looked through them and then what, like if I'm talking to some, when I would talk with someone, if that was something that they would be interested in, uh, that, was, that was something to look at. Uh, also, I use Discord a lot yep. for uh, younger people because it has a voice and text channel. Yep, perfect. Who they're doing and they can get together and they also will sometimes just play video games together yep. and they can process that way. Perfect. Yeah, Discord's a good one too. So what I found um, with uh, family members um, was this, you know, really difficult uh, to, to get themselves to a, a meeting. Either they didn't want their loved one to know they were going to go to a meeting, um, and so the virtual world makes it very easy for them to do this at home. Um, the client that stands out the most to me was a woman um, whose husband uh, gambled and drank a lot and she couldn't get out of the house without having to explain where she was going and she was very anxious and nervous and so she started with a Facebook group for uh, Al-Anon, camera off, and then she slowly was comfortable enough to turn the camera on, slowly comfortable enough to share, and then she finally said to me, okay, I'm ready to go in person now. And so you can even see that as a step towards and not the end all be all, right? As another way to meet people and, you know, kind of warm them up to the, the, these different resources. Um, and so there's, there's pros and cons to all of that, right? To anything that we're doing online, does that prevent them from that real connection long term? And we have to keep thinking about that when we're working with people. Um, how is this helping? And do they need a little nudge eventually to do more? To do what else can they be doing? Right. Okay. Um, we talked about bibliotherapy, right? The new bibliotherapy. How many of you recommend books for your clients? Right. What books do you recommend? What's your go-to's? Nicotine Dreams. I've used. So. Nicotine Dreams. What's Marilyn Lansing? Um, I know. I know too. I see the red cover. Yeah. <laughs> It'll come to us. What about in the back of the room? You said you recommend books. The boy group. I mean, the big book. The big book? Okay. All right. What does the younger generation want? Audio books. Right? Again, that instant on demand. That's that, and audio is not the same as Kindle. Right? This is literally the audio books. So, do we have enough audiobooks of people with lived experience for gambling? Okay, I know the one um, that I go to because I, I do a lot of work with people in New Jersey, right? Arnie Wexler's book. Does Arnie Wexler's book meet someone that's 24? 
right? So there's a gap. His story is great. The wife's story, lots of people benefit from reading that. But for some, it's, it's not the right generation, so it's not relatable. Gripped by gambling. Gripped by gambling. Thank you. And that's not always relatable to all women, right? Because she talks about when she was much, much older. Um, the slot machine, Confessions of the Slot Machine Queen, Sandra Adele. That's another good one. But you've got to start to realize we don't have a lot of books with lived experience for the younger generation. So it's also helpful to encourage people to just kind of write their story, even if it's just for them. If you were reading a, listening to an audiobook, what story would you want? Um, there is a newer one called, it's really a complicated title, it's called Gambling Addiction, right? And it's from a gentleman, um, it's on, it's on uh, uh, Amazon. What's that? No, no, this is, a, this is just a gentleman with you know, lived experience and um, people are finding it very helpful because, and you might want to think about this, he starts the book out with what it's like to be thinking about committing suicide to taking his own life. And it's a real wake up for people. And I've had several of my younger male clients say, oh, I took a step back and I took a pause when I read that. Um, and it's a white cover with red lettering, gambling addiction. If you see it, I can, you know, when we end at 10, 10 o'clock, we can look online. Uh, but you've got to keep thinking about this stuff. So sometimes a homework assignment is to ask your clients to go find See what they find, right? But definitely need more books with li of lived experience for younger. And it's relatable, right? Remember, some of these individuals will have never been inside a casino before. Um, there's another book by um, uh, Tony O'Reilly out of Ireland. His is called Tony 10. And it's good. And it's about, you know, uh, sports betting, but it's still not today's sports betting. So it still misses the relatability of the tech world. Right? So we've got to keep thinking about this stuff and encouraging people. Um, encourage, if you have lived experience, think about yourself. What, what book would you like to write? Yes? I have a grandson who is dealing with a life issue. I like that term, lived experience. However, uh, I listen a lot to him, and uh, my impression is great deal of what he's getting is a matter of the blind leading the blind, and there isn't a, mm -hmm. uh, a perspective on the, the life they're living, Yeah. and it's very much uh, right now, and uh, I don't see that he's getting much benefit from it. Yeah. So I think the, the caution about the blind leading the blind needs to be in front of us as clinicians. Absolutely. Um, so when I was talking about that blog, that gentleman's writing, you know, it's just him writing, him sharing. And when you give homework, they come back and you talk about it. And you're able to say, okay, so you found this relatable or you found that. Yep. Um, Kurt Dahl, D-A-H-L. Thank you. Um, so you're, you're having the conversation as opposed to just go off and do this checkbox. He's done that. He or she's done that task. And so that's where it becomes much help, more helpful. Um, but this is the younger generation is used to finding all their information on the internet and deciding for themselves if they find it helpful or not. So we've got to also work with that. But do you ever uh, encounter or encounter with them the idea of what helpful means? But that's individual, right? It's based on their goals. You have to really do person and environment and understand where they're at. To get a 24-year-old, right, to stop gambling, um, and even you, you don't even sometimes get them to uh, think lifelong. You get them to think just for a year. Let's just talk about hang on to this for a year so that you keep them coming back because they're instant, on demand, and they're gonna bounce quickly. So, you know, I, I can't quite answer your question because it, it, it's so individual with each client, um, what would be considered helpful for them.
but the, the tech world has really changed uh, for, for younger people and what, what they can even fathom long term. It's just so fast. And their whole friend circle, family circle, all of that is so entrenched in, in gambling also. So it's, it can be pretty powerful. I guess the caveat is that what we think would be helpful may not be at all. Again, that's why you have the conversation, right? You really need to have that conversation. I have worked with people for eight years. Eight, right? It's just like you know, we were talking about yesterday with motivational interviewing. It's not just keep taking steps and, and you know, sometimes step back, go to the left, go to the right, you know, all of that. Um, I finally have, get to work with some, some of my clients that are this close to paying off their restitution. How many of you got, have been able to see that before? They're usually long off our caseload before that day arrives, right? And finding ways to keep them engaged. Um, I have lots of clients that say, once a month, I want to see you. I need that accountability. And that's helpful to them. So, okay. All right, so going back to time, access, money. Access. <sighs> How do you prevent access to gambling in an all-tech world? How do you do it? Uh, during certain scripts, you can install on uh, your browser that can block certain sites for you or even replace certain words. Yep. Uh, so there's some blocking. Stuff like that. Uh, and you could install it and then just set a very complicated password and then purposely go away. Yep. There's a lot you can do, right? and you've got a real small window to strike in sometimes. Um, and the first thing I say to all my clients is, we are not gonna be able to prevent all access. I'm not gonna act like we can, I'm not gonna tell family, because family really wants to hear that. Nope, not in the tech world are you ever gonna prevent all access, okay? So one of the things to talk through is depending on um, the, the, what they're doing, if it's legal, illegal, doesn't matter. Some of them really will have like limit setting. They'll have a cool off period where you cannot have access for 30 days. And then the legal is the self exclusion. And, and educating people about this, right? Because some with harm reduction, some aren't ready to quit 100%. How do you get them to just cool off or set limits as a first step? Right. In Pennsylvania, we have um, the Pennsylvania I Lottery. You know, you know what that means, right? And they have all of these features under their responsible gambling tab. And I've gone to a couple of the illegal websites, and they've had something kind of like this, but you have to send it something to customer service, right? But you can get clients to think about, to consider. Let's keep talking about this. If you go to the website, and you've spent a lot of money and you're feeling you know, really embarrassed and the shame is pretty intense. What about a cool off? What about emailing customer service and saying, can you um, block access? Can you c cancel my account? Okay. So being able to really understand what are the features in an app or the software features so that you're doing any type of harm reduction interventions. And so you have to be confident with technology or you have to be comfortable enough to have the conversation about technology with the client and just get curious. Um, I downloaded the DraftKing app because I wanted to kind of see what it did and I wanted to see if I had I just downloaded the app, created a login, that's all I did. That thing buzzed my phone several times a day. I wanted to experience that to understand what it's like for the client that has had that app on their phone. I never went in, did anything, then I deleted it, right? But just to understand all of that. So we talk about self-exclusion, but most of us are very familiar with the brick and mortar, and then we've got to get more comfortable with self-exclusion online. So my, um, my, my call to you, if you do legalize sports betting, Make sure you're looking at the self-exclusion also, okay? Because 
sta some states are doing a great job and other states are not doing so well. And I know when um, I spoke with Indiana, they had some pretty impressive numbers and some things that they were doing. You know, so make sure you're looking at other states and revisiting the self-exclusion. That's going to be really, really important. Um, Pennsylvania, when they did the online, they created a 100% online way of self-excluding. So think about that. The person who's never gone to a casino doesn't have to go to the state office or a casino to self-exclude. They don't have to go in person. So they created 100% online, and I'm so glad they did right before COVID because I was able to get people to still self-exclude during the pandemic because it was all online. And you do it on a computer. I don't recommend a, bra a, a mobile because you have to um, take a picture of your ID. It takes a picture of you. You have to check several boxes. And what Pennsylvania did was they made it the choices, uh, brick and mortar, online casino, brick and mortar sports book, online sports book, fantasy. And you have to, you can pick all of them or pick some of them which I was like, some of them, but you have to understand where are people in their stage of change to do this. We have one year, five year, and lifetime, right? There's no conclusive research that one year or five year, those are good numbers, but everybody's just kind of doing that. Um, and then we have lifetime, right? And depending on the person, I just say to some people, just consider one year, just give me one year. There's a lot we can do in one year. And then you, they stay on the list if they don't do anything. And some people have signed up for one year and they're on it you know, 10 years later. So think about that stage of change and how you get people to consider that. Um, there was uh, um, Arizona. I was talking to Arizona about uh, when they legalized sports betting and online. And they, their self-exclusion is so cumbersome um, right now that it's, it's not really an effective intervention for us as clinicians. And it's tied up in some legal stuff related to getting a notary or being a notary and all this kind of stuff. So think again, as you get, consider expansion of legalized gambling, revisit your self-exclusion. If there's any way to get rid of some old stuff, now would be the time, all right? How many of you recommend self-exclusion to clients? Okay. How many of you have ever like checked out what self-exclusion, like the paperwork, anything like that? Yeah, definitely do that. You, you know, I, I would call the number and I said, I'm a clinician. I don't know anything about this. Please teach me and have the people on the other end of the phone tell me all about it. Please send me brochures so I have them in my office. Anything you can get me so that I, I can, you know, speak confidently about this. What about the illegal gambling sites? How do you prevent access to that? Bad <laughs> right? So, uh, you know, again, I, I am an advisor for Gambit, so I can talk about Gambit a little bit more confidently, but there are other features out there um, that you can use. I know Gamblock's another one that is um, promoted, BetBlocker you were talking about. First and foremost, never promise that these are 100% because they're not. And it, people with, at Gamban are the first to say, this is not a silver bullet. This is not one thing to do and that's it. When you're talking to clients uh, at intake, ask them if they know anything about self-exclusion. Ask them if, they've ever, if they know anything about blocking software. Because you'd be surprised, a lot of them have looked into it. They just haven't acted on it. Right? So with these, right, it's designed, like Gamban's an example, to be very difficult to circumvent or uninstall. So it doesn't quite operate like an app. It takes over the device to prevent, okay? Because you're looking for creating that layered approach with people. So any blocking software is one of several things you would want to do with a client, not the only thing. Uh, if you're familiar with iPhones, how many of you have an iPhone? Okay, so iPhones have, a, uh, by design of Apple, 
nothing can take over the phone 100%. So Gamban will not take over an iPhone 100%. Neither will BetBlocker and all those things. It's by design of the iPhone. I tell my clients that. And I say, if you get around this or you know, try and turn it off or whatever, I'm more curious that you're spending your energy doing that. So let's talk about this, right? And be able to understand that. Some people just, in, they do self-exclusion and they do the software and they go, ah, oh, like the weight of, of the chirping in their ears that, you know, pe you know, almost pecking at them, right? So, but there, no silver bullet with any of this stuff. Um, how much do you think Gamban costs? It's not free, but it's, it's less than like $40 for like a license of seven devices. So it's very easy to tell someone, I'm pretty sure you can afford that given what you were spending gambling. Um, the accountability piece with the younger generation. I have them screenshot once they've installed blocking software and text it to me. All right, that's another thing you can put in treatment planning is how do you kind of do that feedback loop Okay, so then we move to, to finances. How many of you love to do finances with your clients? What? Oh my gosh, nobody? I love it. But you have to think you've got to do access to money and access to gambling at the same time. So these kind of overlay each other. But when we talk about finances, we're really looking, and I can't stress this enough, it's such a critical area of focus. I've had people on um, my trainings say, isn't this out of our scope of competence? And I say, not when you're trained to work with gambling disorders. You're not giving financial advice, you're doing budget and restitution. You're getting them to have a healthier relationship with money. That's different than constantly saying, oh, I don't do finances, so I send them somewhere else. Right? You got to bring it into the session multiple times. So what does financial literacy mean? How many of you have healthy financial literacy? What? What? Nobody's raising their hand? Right? And so that could potentially be counter-transference with not wanting to go there with the client. And we have to go there. How many of you talk about finances early in the therapeutic relationship? Okay, everybody needs to put their hands up eventually, right? I want you to be talking about finances early, especially with the younger generation. In, in the chapter called Finances, we always start every chapter with a quote, and this is my most favorite quote. Money's supposed to hurt when you spend it. Does money hurt when you spend it when everything's virtual? Nope. Does it hurt more when you're like, here's real money, I'm handing it over, right? And you've got to get clients to understand this, in addition to the distortions around money. But money's supposed to hurt when you spend it. You've got to keep saying that to them. And I do this by talking about closing all the doors. So this is a helpful concept. I use the, this, this phrase with clients, what are all the doors to access to money, access to gambling, and how do we close those doors? How many are there, and what, we, what do we need to do to close them? This, again, would help with treatment planning to consider all the different steps to take. Okay? So, <clears throat> all right. So we know this is kind of our oldie but goodie that gamblers have two kinds of money, right? <clears throat> they have real money and they have gambling money. And I've actually done this. You have real money and you have gambling money. And they go, uh-huh, they know exactly it. When I was learning this, I was like, really, really? And then you do it in front of a client and they're like, yep, I got it. I'm like, well, part of our healthier relationship is that we're going to have money, not real money, gambling money. And then that becomes the conversation over and over again. Because we do know that when we don't address that meaning of money 
they're still viewing gambling money as more valuable and that it, the belief that that actually could get them out of debt. So as we're reviewing all of the doors, we have to think, what are all the ways that you gamble? How do we close them? And we have to attend to gender, safety issues, family dynamics, cultural, gender, uh, excuse me, generational, right? In understanding these. So again, this is not like a checkbox. We talked about money. This is really attending to that particular individual. And how do we close all those doors? What are the standard doors that you think of in terms of access to money? Think about yourself. If I shut you off of access to your own money, what would I be doing? Take, okay, take away your bank cards. What would I do to your bank account? No, probably not. I can't do that. How would I, how would I monitor it? They might not tell me the truth if I just talk to them about money, right? Okay. So, oh, and then some people might say that's out of my scope or my agency won't allow that, right? So then we have to, these are good. This is perfect reason we're trying to banter. If I took away access, what does that mean? What does that look like? Who would oversee the bank account? A family member, if, as long as we're attending to safety issues and things like that. The bank has to really be explored too. It really has to be explored, right? This is not easy. That's why you start early and you talk about it often. And this is assuming that the client wants to stop gambling. If they're doing harm reduction, you don't necessarily close all those doors. You build it into their harm reduction plan of how much they can spend gambling and how after they've met all their other bills, okay? So this is not easy. Now, take the younger generation. They have the, the virtual bank account. They have all the, the apps, the virtual apps. How we got, we got to close all those doors, right? Yes? I thought of something. You could ask them to bring in all the receipts and show them to you. Yep, and that is older generation. Perfect. Younger generation will not bring in receipts. They don't keep receipts. Yep. But this is good, right? You've got it. This is why I talk about all the generations and what will work. Okay. So you create a budget so that you get them to understand income and expenses. And how many of you do this? I'm so glad they're taking the tables down right now outside, right? Um, how, how, do, how many of you do a budget with clients? How many of you do it in session with clients? Okay, good. Do you do it on paper? No. No more on paper, right? You've got to make it electronic so that you can keep revisiting it and updating it. How do you do that? Excel? There's apps for that too, yes, right? There's an app for everything, right? So let's, let's talk through that a little bit more. But you get clients to put everything down on a budget. That can take several sessions. I had a gentleman who is uh, very well educated, lots and lots of letters after his name, um, was in the financial industry, and when I asked him for his budget, he came in with post-it notes. What does that tell you? He did not want to deal with this, right? Because <laughs> it was not uh, a, a, about ability or uh, capability. It was, I don't want to deal with this. So doing finances in session, you're able to then help them process how difficult this is. To look at everything all at one time. Great, right? So one of the things we talk about is whether or not you do that budget and restitution as homework or in session, depends on the person. Many of you might have given them homework and how many of them came back and did it, right? Not too many. And you don't just do one month budget, you literally keep revisiting it. How many of you do that? See a couple heads nodding, okay. It is not a one and done. This is a critical therapeutic 
focus to keep looking at this. Family involvement. Family involvement can be really tricky because we don't know what they're telling family. We've got to bring the family in. We've got to talk about finances together. We have to explore those dynamics, right? And we have to really see how this will work. What does that look like for the younger generation? What's family involvement for the younger generation? Parents. Parent involvement. And you've got to explore that dynamic and help launch successfully into adulthood, right? We don't want any failure to launch and talking through all of that with family. And family can be, have a lot of anxiety around the amount of debt, around interest rates. Their goal is to pay things off as quickly as possible because of their anxiety, which is not therapeutically recommended, right? And you have to help teach them. There's a sweet spot of having monthly restitution for a given period of time because it reminds the individual about that, about that gambling debt, right? Okay, so what I do with the younger generation is I use these two features. Uh, Google Sheets, Have any, anybody heard of Google Sheets? <laughs> Jeremy's like, me. Google Sheets is the equivalent of Excel, but it's online and it's real time. And I'll show you, um, well, you know, look at that. So Google Sheets is so great because I sit, and I do this because I do a lot of teletherapy, create a Google Sheet, share the screen, put their email address in it. Now the two of us are connected to this Google Sheet. I can recall it just in a browser anytime I want. So I bring it up session after session. And we're changing things in real time from the budget to actual, talking through things talking about the feels, right? And really helping them see you have this much money coming in, you've been able to ad address the, these expenses, and then if there's any money left over, how do we adjust for that? And a lot of times they haven't done a budget. Now, if I've got family involvement, stick family email in there, and they can see the same thing. When it's all electronic, you can't say, oh, I thought I emailed that to you. You didn't get that attachment, right? <laughs> we don't have any of that. It's just all real time. And TrueLink Financial, do you know what that is? You guys haven't heard of that? Oh, uh, if you walk away with one thing today, it will be this, right? This is just a copy of the website. I think they've updated it. Prepaid Visa card. Huh. Ah, it's not just any prepaid Visa card. This card allows you to block things. You can block gambling and casino transactions. You can block alcohol and liquor purchases. You can block pawn shops. You can block wiring money. You can do all kinds of stuff. It's all online. Now, the way it's best used is where um, it's a very slow process. It takes about five weeks to really get up and running because it connects to a bank account. So you have to have done the budget. You have to have all the financial stuff discussed and then you connect it to a bank account and it brings, it, it drops money into the card on a whatever you set. I always set it to weekly so that if someone is supposed to be living within a hundred dollar budget, it gives them $100 on the card. Now, I've shown this and people are like, I'm getting that for my kid in college the minute I leave here, right? <laughs> because it's, it was originally designed for um, older adults that were having um, dementia or Alzheimer's um, and for uh, intellectual disabilities, but still giving people access to their own money without getting into trouble. So it's, it serves a lot, and I think they stumbled upon the gambling world, and we're all like, this is amazing, okay? $10 a month, which is nothing, when you think about being able to uh, give somebody a card that has their name on it, the Visa logo, and it acts like a credit card and a debit card, because I've had younger people say they go to lunch with friends, and they don't have cash and they don't, can't use their car, like this gives them that autonomy. And guess what else it does? It shows every single transaction 
because they're not going to bring back receipts. Okay, so this one is a really, really helpful one. And as you're doing both your budget and getting this set up, then you need to talk about the emotional aspect. Just putting all that together, just saying we're cutting access to money has a lot of emotions to it. And if we make this too task oriented, we forget to sit and talk about how that feels what that feels like, right? And I, earlier in my career, I, I'm guilty of getting too focused on the tasks, check, 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 and I wasn't attending enough to the emotional. One woman came into my office with all her bills unopened. She says, I can't do this. You have to help me with this. I can't handle the emotions that are going to come from opening these envelopes. I don't want to know what this looks like, right? So the shame, the embarrassment, the I can't believe I have that much debt are all the things that people are, are, have to process. How am I ever going to get out of debt? And you have to be able to process that without saying, oh, you will, don't worry, you know. Um, change the narrative. I have one gentleman and his relapse trigger is that he, and he does financially very well, but he also has a lot of gambling debt. And he, his trigger is um, when he gets paid, he just keeps thinking, I'm not saving anything. I don't have any money in savings. I'm like, that's your narrative? And he's like, yeah. And I'm like, how about your narrative might be, you have enough money to pay all your bills and all your needs as long as you don't gamble. He's like, well, that would be a different narrative now, wouldn't it, right? And just talking through that. Because he would gamble when he was like, I don't have any money in savings, and then you know, $10,000 later, he's more in debt. And I was like, it's not working. So we kind of hear the, the MI stuff from yesterday coming through, right? But being able to change that conversation, that view of things. So can't underscore that one enough. How about this? Virtual money apps. These are just a couple. How many of you use any of these? Okay. How many of you have ever had a client that said, um, I'll just Venmo you my copay? <laughs> Jeremy's like, yep. Can you do that? Can you accept Venmo? Yeah, friends will do it. They get real used to Venmo this. Venmo. So as a client, you can, as a clinician, you can't accept Venmo because it's not HIPAA compliant and it has their name on it. All right, so then you're violating confidentiality. And they don't know this. They're just so used to the virtual world. All right, so we have to talk through this. But there's a whole other aspect to this now. Crypto. Right? A little chuckle. What do we know about crypto? Very little. Very little. <laughs> uh, and week after week, we're still going to know very little, right? We heard yesterday's uh, panel talking just briefly about that whole world. Um, I don't even know that much about crypto, but I'm curious with my clients, and they tell me about crypto. So, one of the most recent stories, um, a gentleman said, I can't do this anymore. I got to stop. I'm, this is just this is affecting my marriage. Um, and I said, all right. Talked about all the, closing all the doors. And I said, what's the one door your wife doesn't know about? And he's like, Venmo with crypto. And I was like, oh, okay. And tell me more as if I don't know anything. And he's like, well, you go to the ATM and you pull out money, and then you can upload it with a QR code to, and it converts it, but it, they keep their percentage. And I said, well, what's the percentage like? And he said, and again, real money, gambling money. He said, well, I'll take out a thousand dollars and they'll keep 200 of it. Right? You all just had a real money reaction, not a gambling money reaction, right? <laughs> And I was like, oh, okay, 200. Mm -hmm. And he's like, now that I say that out loud to you, that sounds really bad, <laughs> right? And I said, 
so your wife doesn't know about this? And he said, no. And then I just gamble on the illegal sites using the crypto and use the, the app for that. You guys surprised by that? All right, and you're, and you're just like, okay, so when do you get it back in real money? And he's like, well, this is why I need to stop gambling because I never get it back because I spend all of it. And we had this very playful conversation and I'm going, yikes, inside that this happens, right? All right, so you are in Pennsylvania, New Jersey, Arizona, New York, Illinois, like just decide the states that already have all the online sports betting. Connecticut's the newest one. And you go to the, the CVS and you have DraftKings app on your phone. And you go to the CVS, CVS, what is that? The drugstore. Drug so you're not gonna believe the story I'm gonna tell you. And you go to the ATM conveniently at the CVS and you take out money, and then you go to your DraftKing app. Now, if I have a family member that's not quite watching, I have access to the ATM, don't I? Then I, I go to my app and I say, I want to deposit money so that I can gamble, and DraftKings gives me a QR code of some sort, and I go to this self-checkout at the CVS and I do the QR code as a item that I want to pay for and I put the cash in the machine and I have now loaded money on my DraftKings app. Did you follow that? That's the world out there, right? You can withdraw Bitcoin, yes. Mm -hmm. Yep, so you can do all of those things, right? So you see the importance of understanding um, the, the money, having this conversation, okay? So I went on their web, I just Googled to see, can I get a DraftKings gift card? Why, yes, you can. So now my loved one is watching and every transaction and I go to use my TrueLink card to get a gift card because it's a gift card transaction and I get a gambling gift card. So I don't know if TrueLink would actually block that. I'm sure they're going to catch on to this quickly, right? But you can see if you haven't closed all these doors, you see how easy it is, right, and difficult to trace. My, Did you uh, try again? my Siri just came on, <laughs> which I don't use. Okay. Um, all right. So um, I was talking with Brian in Connecticut, the guy that does the All In Addicted Gamblers podcast, and he said that he was at CVS to get a prescription filled, and it wasn't ready yet. And so he was hanging around the CVS. Poor CVS. I've been talking really bad about them lately, <laughs> right? And he was like, we went over to the gift card section. And that's where he saw you can get DraftKings gift card in Connecticut. And they just, just legalized sports betting. So I was at my local grocery store, not a chain, not a big name grocery store. And I'm in the self-checkout and I turn and the gift cards are there. And this is what I saw. Look at these dollar amounts. 50 to 100, 20 to 50, and 100 to 400. Have you ever gotten a gift card and put $400 on it? <laughs> Real money, gambling money. Okay? Now, if I have done what I need to do, I don't have access, I've self excluded, I have blocking software, I have accountability. This is like, ugh, but I don't go, ooh, a new door to go through because I can't get this and then go to DraftKings because I have self-excluded. I can't do this and go to DraftKings because I have blocking software. So 
So even though this stuff is out there, it, it, we've got to help people have a very, very high wall built so that it's harder to get over. Even though they could, it's harder to get over that wall, right? And we talk about that. So you got to think generational. And then what generation? How do you close those doors? How do you help people give up that financial control? What's that accountability, that transparency? What's the budget, the restitution plan? And then monitor it monthly. If you can keep people in your setting that long, right? And so talk to them about control and surrender when you're closing those doors. So as we come to close to the end, these are just some real quick things to share. My sessions with younger generation tend to be very active and task focused in the beginning. Keep them busy, that instant on demand, and then move over to warning signs, kind of processing more, the, what's under the tip of the iceberg, all of those types of things. So I don't know if you'll find that to be um, what, what happens when you're working with younger generation, but very, very task focused in the beginning. Right? My classic failure to launch, right? Um, when I have the adult gambler and their parents' involvement, really helping to understand uh, the, the parents to understand what failure to launch symptoms look like, how they're, they're too involved, right? And what control looks like, what is abstinence, what about GA, and how to detach. One thing that we're finding um, working really well in our group practice is to do relationship counseling in early recovery. Do you guys remember ever being told like, don't do couples counseling for till someone has like a year in recovery? Right? We're finding not to wait, to do things earlier. So in, in our practice, one person's working with the individual, the other person's working with a family member, and a third person is then doing relationship counseling. And it's helping <coughs> get them to the same rest reset, restart place so that the family member can really explore and share how they're feeling, uh, you know, the, the hurt, uh, the lies, the deceit, all of those things, okay? And so think about that if you have an opportunity. That's kind of why I say to, to get to know each other more and really, you know, share the resources with each other. Gambling motivated crime. These are slides directly from Dr. Malkin, um, so I don't change them. I just that's why you don't have them in your handout. Um, she's doing a lot of research. It's really, really early. She's coined the term gambling motivated crime. Do you guys like that? I like it a lot. I think it really, really fits. Um, so she's really focused on the majority of gambling motivated crime is nonviolent and financial. And the definition is really that you're seeing people cross that line eventually. Not everybody does, but you're seeing people eventually cross that line um, to, to get more money. And, and unfortunately, in the legal system, they view this uh, as you know crimes like fraud, embezzlement. They don't see this as driven due to um, a disorder in the same way that we're seeing with drugs and alcohol. So what happens, it's that cycle. You've got to keep acquiring money to gamble with, to pay the debt off that makes the debt larger, to keep acquiring money. And, uh, but they all believe that they're just borrowing. Right? And in talking with some of the individuals that I've done forensic reports on, they just were like, I don't remember the day that I thought it was okay to take money. I thought I was borrowing it and I was gonna pay it back the next paycheck. So, pretty severe. Um, she's, she's, you're looking at some of these dates of 2008, right, 1989, 1998. So we have a long way to go with getting more relevant research and bringing awareness. So we, I don't even you know, talk to clients about the prevalence, but I, you have to understand that there's also um, a larger group of people than you realize on your caseload that might have done some sort of crime and they're just, they haven't told you. But what happens if they do tell you? 
So she's put together seven steps, all right? Clients are going to be honest with you if you've gained their trust. They might actually not tell you. They might tell you things a little bit over time. I had a, a person tell me um, they were very high up in the IT department of a large company, and they were in charge of taking all the iPads and iPhones that were old from, you know, that was employer-based, paid for, and he, uh, this person sold them and used the money to gamble with. Okay. Um, four years later, the audit caught up to that. Four years. So what I've seen with a lot of individuals is it's a long time before they get caught. And that also is um, not in their favor. Okay. So she's saying, you know, the minute they tell you something, tell them to get an attorney. Just go seek legal counsel. Go talk to someone right? Um, don't talk without an attorney to answer any questions. Don't put anything in writing. Uh, don't talk about it anywhere but in counseling where we are bound by confidentiality and don't share in a GA meeting, which GA tells you not to do that, right? Um, start going to GA meetings, staying in counseling, get a new job, any of those things. Um, and her biggest thing right now is that you deserve the benefits of the protection offered by the legal system. Um, what she's finding and what I have seen is that women are getting harsher sentences than men. Right? Yes. Yeah. Right. So, so start, you know, think about that because as we get into, um, you know, that virtual space, right? crypto, Bitcoin, anything like that? Is there other ways to, to, you know, steal money, not make it easily traceable? And then have you ever had a client that said, uh, can I play fantasy sports even though I'm not gambling anymore? What's the harm? So what would you say if you have somebody that wants to still do fantasy sports league? Okay. It's still gambling. Um, what I found was that starts to get a little bit of a ping pong match going, and I don't want that. And so I've said, I don't, I don't really think it's about that. I think it's more about what if you win? So you're playing, what if you win? You just let the tiger out of the cage. You know, you can't put it back. What if you win? Do you really want to risk that? Because they're not thinking about the win. They're thinking about playing because they don't want to give something up. Get them to the point of, what if you win? Boom, boom, boom. I can do this again. This isn't enough. I can make it better. Blah, blah. And get them to go all the way down that path that they've been down before. When I did this, I got away from the ping pong control battle. And they were kind of like, yeah, I see what you mean. You know, the dopaminergic system that you talk about. What might happen? And you just... Kind of let them do that. Let them make a decision. And very much with sports betters, I got this. See ya. Bye-bye. They don't hang around very long. I got this. And I always say, okay, just want you to know, you know, my door's always open. I'm always here. And some people do experience a relapse, and sometimes it's pretty significant. This is a judgment-free zone shame-free zone environment, just come back because they, they really want to bolt fast, all right? So last thing to think about as I kind of put this together from the, the conference, think about treatment funding with any expansion, especially teletherapy. Think about ex uh, better self-exclusion. Uh, councils across the country are getting uh, licenses for blocking software to be able to give out. Think about that and any trainings you can do for the legal system, All right? So those would be some takeaways. And with that, any questions? Did you learn anything? Yes. Yeah? Are you ready to work with those sports bettors? Those online 22-year-olds? Bring them on, right? 
Um, and just if anybody's curious, we just started a, a, a program for healthy gaming for parent and for player. And so as you get curious and start talking with more people, um, feel free to email me, um, check this out. It's super helpful in healthy conversations. It's definitely helpful getting parents to have those healthy conversations and then they get in, find out all the gambling that's going on in the, ga in the gaming world. Okay, so with that, thank you so much. Thank you everyone thank you. for your time. Really appreciate it.